This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Well, welcome to the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam, and I'm your host, and I'm joined by the man who's been married for 40 years 40 now. years, yes. Celebrating good to be with you, Sam. 40 years of marriage, Richard. It's good to see you. Uh, yeah, just as of yesterday. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine, like, four decades racing by like that, but I know. Uh, it does. So, Well, you know, Richard, you're unique <clears throat> in that, uh, you know, it, it's. I, I think people will struggle to find... A person uh, more romantic, I think, uh, than yourself. Oh, I know. Uh, it's a gift. And let me just paint a picture for our for our <laughs> listeners here as we as we get started. Be careful, Sam. Because there is a you know there is a tie in here, and, and we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. But uh, for your fortieth, you know, you think to yourself, well, well, what you know, what would you do? What says forty what says years of 40 marriage? Years of marriage? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What says I love you? Yeah. Um, and and I think. Uh, the thing that you came up with, yeah. and you know, it did come overnight. It took some work. No, this this is there, there was planning. You you read uh, just to give you uh, some insight a nine hundred page biography yeah. in preparation, in preparation. Yeah. for your fortieth anniversary yeah. trip. Yeah. Which how I many people do that exactly? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, that that's a uh, a party of one. <laughs> uh, but you uh, so uh, romantically took oh, yeah. Lisa, your wife, cue the violins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to Virginia and the yeah. surrounding area to yeah. see uh, all the uh, various um, deathbeds of yeah. our founding fathers. Yeah, and, we saw uh, where four American presidents had actually died in the very bed they died in. So, you know, I some just, cemeteries where they were buried in. Yeah, saw one gun that was used to assassinate uh, a president. So. You know, yeah. I just, it, it's hard to imagine a more romantic getaway. Well, and it, Richard, you've, you've just, I, you've I, set the bar so high. Well, it's a, it's, for the rest it's a of unique us. getaway. Yeah. yeah I, and I would just, in my defense, <laughs> <laughs> I did say to Lisa, would you like to go to Hawaii? Would you like to go to Europe? Like we, this is 40. We should make, do a big deal about this. And, and anywhere exotic, she said, oh, I'd feel guilty if we didn't have the kids with us. And well, so, in, and in your defense as well, I, uh, you know, Carrie and I were talking about this, and we think likely, I, I think the reason that she decided on, on this trip uh, is because anywhere else there would just be too much guilt and not having the grandkids with you. So she she could she'd feel although, okay if yeah. she was you know at although, the estate although of Although we, when we were Washington. at the Smithsonian, she was like those grandkids would like this, and yeah, so but yeah, yeah actually I, I did have this vision of because my wife uh, usually I'm racing here and there and and uh, and I I did have this vision. I've always liked the countryside in Virginia and uh, the estates and yeah. the the ran, you know the horse pastures and stuff and uh and so i actually kind of thought wouldn't that be kind of cool to drive through the countryside to some of those old plantation houses Mm -hmm. where we're not fighting through traffic and there's not a big rush and you know like mount vernon we toured that i I booked it i think 11 o'clock in the morning so we didn't have to get up early and then we had lunch there afterward and and uh so it actually worked out night. We we're in the countryside, and it was yeah. for me. It was actually very different to just have a laid back kind of. And she actually really liked some of that history too. So yeah, well, and there's no you don't have the jet lag. You know, there there yeah. are some advantages. And, uh, yeah, one hour flight uh, or so <clears throat> to uh, Washington Dulles. But so uh, yeah, we will do the more exotic. And I did offer it. I did put that on the table yeah. for her. Yeah. But, and I am taking her to Canada in two weeks uh, to go and see her grandkids up there. And so we... Yeah, well, well, you know, uh, but we'll let yeah, the record show was, that that was... Well, and, and I will also say I, uh, much of that was... And I, I kept saying, oh, this does not have to be about me. I'm just... I, I just want to come up with... But I do want to do something. I don't want to just put it off until we can all go to Hawaii five years from now. And uh, But I think she was very gracious. She knows that this was a bucket list for me. And uh, so that's what we did. But... Well, but, you know, and a fringe benefit of that, it just so happens that uh, a lot of what you were touring and, and, and the uh, the people's estates and so forth that you were seeing uh, has a tie into leadership. It does. And coincidentally, I think we'll probably get about four podcasts out of your your uh, yeah. 
Uh, there, see? Your anniversary trip. God is blessing. Yeah, yeah. you know, and that's yeah. what a great uh, <laughs> un, unplanned but fringe benefit of, uh, of 40 years of wedded bliss. There and you so go. We're going to start off this series um, looking at, uh, at some of the leadership of those uh, founding fathers of our country. Yeah, we're just kind of calling it leadership lessons from the founding fathers. And there's a lot, obviously, you can pull from those uh, folks. And I thought maybe just today that we would talk about what I just call leadership is messy. And, um, and you, you, you quickly realize that, by the way, you know, part of the, why I want to go to Virginia was that four of the first six presidents in the United States come from Virginia. And so, and they're all four of them are, uh, they are well in that day, in their day, wealthy slaveholders. They, they live on plantations. And so, Mm when those uh, founding fathers are, uh, you know, writing and championing uh, liberty and democracy and the rights of people and the inalienable rights, uh, they're all doing that, writing all that out on plantations that are being serviced by slaves. And so mm-hmm. uh, I was in uh, James Madison's office where he wrote the, dec- the the Bill of Rights and where he put the constitution together uh and but he looks right out his window on a plantation with slaves working on it and there's probably a slave bringing his lunch in for him and yet he is writing out the bill of rights uh and so uh you know you 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 read that and you you and you read that history and some people can just get very jaundiced about that and say well they're all a bunch of hypocrites they said that they believed in life and liberty and happiness pursuit of happiness but they they didn't really because they uh were turned a blind eye to a lot of people that uh were in their care but but what i what you realize is uh, as i you, you certainly realize that when you're in Thomas Jefferson's place and Madison's and Washington's and so on is that uh, the leadership is rarely black and white. It's, it's rarely just very, very clear without any nuance of any kind. Mm-hmm. Uh, le- leadership often is, is complicated. There's, there, there's rarely is leadership just about one issue. Uh, yeah. There's usually multiple issues that leaders are trying to address all at the same time. And each issue has different ramifications. Some some issues are uh, much more difficult than others and have bigger returns sometimes than others. And so a leader is looking at all the everything on the table and trying to figure out what do I do with this? What what's a priority? What do I do first? What's the most important? Um, and so um, it's possible for and and what I and certainly for. In recent years, where there's been some real pressure on, uh, on looking at leaders, and there, there was a lot of uh, statues that were being torn down, and especially from the Civil War era and so on, or in, in Washington's era where they ha- had slaves, and so it's kind of like, well, if these people had slaves, then they're all bad. Yeah, they're they're bad leaders, and so on. Uh, but what what you realize in part is that. It is possible for a leader today or 200 years ago uh, to be doing one thing that's right and another thing that's wrong. And you don't necessarily, it doesn't make what they did that was right, it doesn't become wrong because they did something else that's wrong. Uh, They can legitimately do something that's very noble and right and good even while at the same time they're doing something over here that we might consider today to be quite heinous and and terrible well and i think that's i think that can be uh tricky and uh difficult for i think people today to get a grasp on because i think there is such a um concern for orthodoxy uh i think in our climate today just yeah. just whether that's in religion or that's in uh secular politics like you you need to be in line on all of these areas and not just one of them. And so it, it's sort of a luxury, I think, of hindsight to look back at these leaders and say, well, you know, how could how could they possibly have done these things, you know, when they had these obvious shortcomings? Yeah, and, and I, so that's why I say one of the things when you're evaluating any, any leader from a previous era is that you have to evaluate them based on their context. And you can't take... 
your 21st century history and science and knowledge uh, and then pull it back a couple hundred years and say, well, why didn't they know this? <laughs> why yeah. didn't, you know, with all the things I know in my day that I can Google and find out if I don't know it, why would they not have known it when they lived in an era long before cell phones and computers and even cars? Um, and so, for instance, history. Um, there are certain moments in history that that after the fact, uh, it's going to be completely different. Like just think now about even something like the COVID pandemic. Um, the, when we went into it the first time, there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot mm-hmm. of we didn't know what to do and what the experts were saying here or there. Uh, I suspect that if another pandemic like that happens, uh, we're going to treat it differently. I think, you know, even things like people weren't sure about vaccines or whatever. I think people are going to have their minds made up much more the next time. Yeah. Uh, and I think there'll be much more certainty. It'll be, there'll be much more clear. I think churches will, uh, will approach that much differently about, and politicians, I think will, will do a lot of things differently. And why? Because we've gone through one now and we've, we've had that experience. And so that history is going to affect how we approach the next pandemic that comes along. That's just the nature of history if you learn anything from it. And so if you've had 250 years of history more than someone else, then you've got 250 years of leadership history lessons that those people didn't have. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we draw upon a lot more. And, and the same with science. Uh, we know from science a lot of things about the human body, about race, uh, about psychology and, and how people function and so on that uh, they didn't have 250 years earlier than us. And so uh, and so you, you have to say, well, based on what they knew then, not, not based on what we know now, but based on what they knew uh, and the technology and the science and so on, the history they had, uh, how do you evaluate what they did? And, and it's hard for us. It's very hard because we just assume that what is so self-evident to us, uh, it's funny because I, there are people I would just say, if I could put you in a time machine and put you back 300 years, it would not be self-evident to you then. It is now because you've had yeah. all this history. So, so that's one thing is, um, to, uh, uh, to, to to evaluate people based on their world, their understanding, their worldview, what, what what world knowledge and scientific knowledge was available to them then, as opposed to now. And so this, yeah, this past week uh, I had the opportunity. We went to Mount Vernon, where Washington's uh, uh, place was. We went to Montpelier, where James Madison lived. Went to Monticello, where uh, Jefferson lived. I wanted to go and see James Monroe's place as well, which is nearby, but uh, I, I wanted to show some discretion and how hard I pushed my wife to see those places. Uh, we also went to Ford's Theater where uh, Lincoln was assassinated and mm-hmm. then crossed the street uh, to the Peterson House where he died. And so I, we actually saw the beds where four, four presidents died. Three of them were uh, at home, and then, of course, four, uh, uh, Lincoln was assassinated, and so we saw where he died. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's interesting that four out of the first six uh, presidents lived in Virginia. Uh, they were slave owners. They, all, they weren't business people like we would think of today. They were farmers. In fact, Washington used to call himself like a citizen farmer. That's, what, that's his first title, even though he was a general and uh, president was. He saw himself as a farmer. Um, and so, but each of them, if you, if you read their writings and their letters and some of their statements, all four of uh, those early presidents uh, at, at, from Virginia, they all knew that something like slavery was wrong. Uh, they, they were not proud of it. Um, they, they saw the, the ugly side of it, uh, the, the, and they, and they knew that, uh, it did not match up with all the ideals that they had for liberty and justice and so on. Here, they're getting a chance to start a brand new nation based on, uh, truth and freedom and liberty and so on, justice. And yet you've got this big, ugly, 
uh, issue of slavery right there in the middle of things that they know doesn't match up with all the rhetoric that they're talking about. Um, and so you, but, it, but that, that often is a leadership issue because there's always the ideal and then there's the pragmatics. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I've known, we've talked about this before, but, uh, there, there are times where I've known leaders that got so hung up on the ideal that they couldn't get anything done, uh, unless it was perfect, unless it was the, the perfect ideal. Uh, they were not ready to pull the trigger. And so uh, in the end, they didn't really get much of anything done because they could never, in politics, it's it's hard to get all the stars aligning just right so that everything is perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so leaders are always facing that issue of, uh, should we go ahead and get, I know this isn't the best, I know that it could be better, but if we don't pull the trigger on this and get this deal done, and compromise. Of course, some some people just uh, just refuse to compromise at all. They uh, they just feel like um, any compromise is selling out, and so I'm going to just hold out until I get everything that I want and that I think should be there. Um, and of course, a lot of times in politics, it's that just isn't the way you, that you get things done. Unfortunately, um, and there's something else that's interesting about these uh, the guys in Virginia as well, and that is. Uh, they're all in debt. Uh, you know, we, we kind of look at these guys living on plantations with a couple hundred uh, slaves and these nice houses and lots of land, and they go around in these nice carriages. And you think these guys were all just getting filthy rich on the on the backs of of slave labor and so on. And certainly, they lived a, a better life than the slaves did, and better than a lot of the their fellow citizens did. But uh, when you when you kind of read the correspondence of those guys, I don't know as much about James Monroe, but uh, but Washington was constantly constantly struggling with making ends meet, and there'd be a, a drought, and his crops didn't work out, and the and the tobacco uh, crops were getting uh, worse and worse every year, and there'd be uh, a, a a hail storm that took out a bunch of his stuff, and. Uh, there'd be a disease with the cattle, and uh, and so he's uh, just constantly battling that, and and so when Washington, I mean, there's times where he's not even sure that he can be, he'll be solvent. He when he when he's going to go to his first inaugural uh, inauguration as president, he actually he has to actually borrow money uh, so he can buy a suit and like look decent at his own inauguration as the first president. Mm. He doesn't have the money in the bank to do that. Uh, and so uh, Jefferson, he's so broke that when he dies, they have to basically sell off his estate, sell off at piecemeal all of his equipment just to try to pay off all the debt that he carried to to the grave with him. Uh, mm. Madison, the same way. His he, and, and, and part of the problem with those guys is that uh, they were... They were gone a lot. Uh, Washington, it just it drove him to distraction. Uh, that he he spent six years uh, leading, fighting the Revolutionary War. Uh, he spends eight years as president, uh, and so he's got to get someone else uh, to superintend his all of his farms and uh, his his work while he's gone. And he he can't ever get anybody that, of course cares nearly as much as he does and watches out for expenses and wastage the way he does. And, and so, uh, he's, it just drives him to distraction, uh, that he can just see the productivity going down every time he's not on the property. And, yeah. and when he's there, he, he rides around, he basically Washington had about five different farms, uh, of, on his plantation and he would get on his horse and he'd ride to each one every day just to check up, make sure they're doing the work. And so they're gone for long periods of time. And so there's just not much that gets uh, done. It's very uh, unproductive and inefficient. And so uh, every one of them, uh, when, when James Madison dies, he's not sure that he'll have enough money to, uh, to outlast or to last till he dies. Uh, but he finally dies on his plantation, but then his widow has to sell the property because she can't afford to live there anymore. And she dies basically in poverty. Uh, and so... Uh, and most of these guys, when they would borrow money, they would borrow it from Britain. That's where the the banks were, um, and so it also really slanted their view of Britain. Uh, that's why people like 
Jefferson and Madison liked the French a lot more than the British. Uh, in part, it was because they owed money to the British. And yeah. uh, when they had the revolution, they actually had entertained the thought of just canceling all debts. Uh, and of course, the, the people running the government, a lot of them had big debts to Britain, including Washington and Jefferson and Madison. And uh, Je but, but Washington just felt like that would not be ethical and it would not get the country off to a good start. Um, and so you realize that even as they are um, having to lead a country, they all are also agonizing about how to pay their bills. And mm. Washington, even on the eve of some of the revolutionary battles he's going to fight, is in his tent writing letters back to a superintendent about trying to repair this damage that happened and, uh, and selling off this land that's unprofitable and what to do uh, with this crop that now that there's been so much damage from weather. Uh, and so for us, it just seems real simple. Like, we'll just... You know, let all the slaves go. Just, just you're the president. Just uh, release all the slaves. But, um, but there was there was definitely a lot, lot more complicating issues uh, that they had to take into account. Uh, it, it was not, at least in their minds, it was not s nearly as straightforward and as simplistic of a solution as it seems to us today. Yeah. Well, like you said at the start, like it's a it's a real messy form of leadership. Well, let's take a, a quick break here. This fall, we've got two opportunities to attend the spiritual leadership coaching workshop that Blackaby Ministries offers uh, each year. Normally, we just have one in the fall uh, in Jonesboro, but this year we have, in addition to the one uh, in Jonesboro, we have one in Rapid City, South Dakota. And these are for folks who work with people. Uh, you might be thinking, well, I'm not interested in coaching. That's not really something uh, I'm into. But I would say that anyone who deals with people uh, can learn something from these uh, coaching workshops. It's really learning about how to ask the right questions to help move people onto God's agenda. These coaching workshops will be uh, October 23rd and 25th. That's going to be the one in Jonesboro, Georgia. And then October 12th and 14th will be the one in Rapid City, South Dakota. All the information about both of these can be found at blackabycoaching.org slash workshop. Uh, there is um, a discount for early registration, and that goes through uh, the month of August. And so if you would like to attend one of these, uh, best to sign up sooner rather than later. Well, it's no surprise that uh, if when you're starting a country, uh, it's not a real clean, uh, straight line from point A to point B. And as you were mentioning before the break, uh, the Founding Fathers, Washington, Jefferson, uh, Madison, all these guys had complicated issues going on both personally and uh, professionally. So uh, as you've just returned from the great state of Virginia, uh, what are some other uh, insights that you that you gathered? Yeah, well, uh, for instance, you know, a lot of people said uh, when uh, Washington was uh, president, why didn't he just, you know, spearhead a, a, a bill uh, liberating all the slaves and just setting them all free? He, he knew it was wrong. And interestingly, with uh, Washington, he was also very, very efficient and he hated waste. He was a very hardworking, uh, organized person and and he, purely on an economic level, regardless about the, the moral level, he just felt like slavery was just a very inefficient. So we, we think, well, wow, I mean, you get two, three hundred people, free labor, like slave, working for you every day. Like, just imagine if I had a bunch of slaves working for me, how, how you know, efficient it would be, how much more work I could get done. But but uh, Washington was very... Uh, uh, he would account for his labor, his costs, and his the overhead. And so, like, if he, at one point, he'd look and he'd say, okay, I've got, you know, 300 slaves, but uh, 200 of them are children or elderly, uh, crippled people that can't work. And so I've only got 100 of the, two, of the 300 that I can actually get a day's work out of. But I've got to feed the other 200. I've got to clothe the other 200. I've got to provide medicine and doctors if one, any of those get sick. I've got to house all those people. Uh, so I've got to grow enough crops and vegetables and food to feed all 300, even though I only get 100 uh, labor. And it's kind of interesting with Washington. He, 
he it always bewildered him why his slaves didn't work as hard as he did. And he he would try to preach to them the virtues of hard work, and it's like, well, but it's your property. It's your you get yeah. the profits. I whether I work hard or I work little, I I get the same meal at the end of the day and one one set of clothing a year. Uh, so yeah, what's in it for me to work hard? And so yeah. Washington would it would drive him crazy. He often said. If I, if you could just take away all my overhead, if I didn't have to house these slaves and feed them and clothe them and medicate them, if I could just didn't have any of that overhead and all I had to do is just pay them uh, a decent wage to come every day and work, and I could fire all the ones that didn't work hard and just send them away, uh, then he said, I think I'd it, it would pay better to to do it that way, but he had all these slaves and he. He couldn't just, uh, you know, so we said, why, why not just give them away then and set them all free? But, uh, but part of his problem was political. Uh, and it's interesting because four of the, the first six presidents are from Virginia, but Washington, his greatest opposition ultimately came out of Virginia because uh, the Virginians were paranoid that he was going to do just that, that he was mm-hmm. going to free all the slaves. And, and uh, so the, the, the Virginian... Uh, legislators and congressmen, senators, made it very clear to him that if the, if he even entertained such a thought, they would just leave the union. They would just vote to leave the United States. And we forget that now, that now we think of the United States as a country, but we forget that in Washington's day, they didn't think that way. Mm-mm. They thought of it as we've, we've lived in Virginia all of our life, and it's been an independent, standalone state. And... <clears throat> And only in just the last couple of years has it belonged to uh, a confederation of other states. And uh, and so they didn't think in terms of a country. And they would have very happily just pulled out and said, we're done with uh, this. And so Washington and the, and the early leaders, I mean, whether you can fault them on it or not with their reasoning, uh, they had a genuine concern that if they did set the, the slaves free, the country would just fall apart. That Virginia would leave, that they would say, well, we're not going to set our f- slaves free. We just won't be a part of the U.S. then. And the, and the whole nation would have just been born, basically stillborn, before it ever really got off the ground being a nation. They would have just been torn asunder. And they they basically knew in their guts, I think, that only a civil war would set those free uh, slaves free, and they didn't want to have a civil war one year into being a country. Yeah. And so they kind of pushed that down line to... To Lincoln to have to deal with, but uh, but it, you know you say well why don't he just set them free? Uh, it's the right thing to do, but in their minds they had to preserve the nation at this point, and uh, uh, and I think it was Lincoln who actually said uh, might have been Washington, but he, uh, there's a famous quote where he said you know if you're if you've got uh, an illness uh, in your body and you maybe in your foot and so you have to. Uh, you, you ultimately have to amputate your foot to save the body. He said, sometimes that's what you have to do. Uh, you got to, you have to pay a price to save the body. But he said, but you would never like cut off a body to save a foot. And he said that because you you want to, you have to save the body. And so he would say, if basically, if you if you have to like, if you lose the whole country to try to uh, address a major problem, then you've, you've sacrificed the whole nation. You can't do that. So, so they, they were never willing to go quite that far um, yeah. until they felt like the time would be right, would, until sentiment had really grown against slavery and so on. And they, I think sometimes leaders have a sense of timing, and they felt like I think the timing was just not going to be right uh, then uh, as it would be later. But uh, and, I, and there's some... We can certainly second guess from uh, yeah. hundreds of years later whether they could have made it work if they tried. Uh, I suppose if they really tried, it might have been ugly. It might have been a civil war uh, a couple of generations sooner. Uh, maybe sometimes the right thing to do it needs to be done regardless of the consequences or the fallout. Uh, but they weighed all of that and were mortified. And of course, they'd they'd spent six years fighting the British already. They, they, thousands of people had died, farmland had been destroyed, battlefields were etched out across the land. They they weren't ready to go straight headlong into a civil war after that. They just felt like we've there's been enough killing and fighting. 
we need time just to grow as a nation right now. And so, um, so that, but as lead, but leaders all face that where yeah. you've got to say, I know I need to address this. Is this the time to do it? Uh, or if I wait, will it be less painful or will I have more resources? Will I have more votes on my side? Uh, will people be dissatisfied enough with the status quo that they're ready now to go with change like they weren't before? Mm-hmm. Um, those are all issues that you have to you have to take a hard look at, and uh, and so when you when you kind of lean in a bit and you look at what these uh, plantation owners, these early leaders were facing, um, you realize not not that it doesn't make slavery right, it doesn't mean that it, you know they were moral in what they were doing. But you realize it was not a slam dunk, at least in their minds, uh, that they, uh, and for some, in some cases, they, uh, just from a financial perspective, Jefferson would have been ruined uh, had he just released all of his slaves. And uh, that doesn't mean, that doesn't justify it, but you realize they, there was a huge price to pay for some of them. And for better or worse, uh, they ultimately, history shows they weren't ready to pay that price. Yeah. Uh, the banks might not have let them, uh, or fellow politicians might not have let them. Uh, but um, that's the crossroad of leadership. It's, it's messy. There's a lot of conflicting interests uh, going on at times, and, uh, and that's where leaders work. It's never usually a, a, a pretty pristine world in which all the decisions are very black and white and obvious to all. Uh, well, I feel like, you know, leadership is, is something that's not really done in the lab. Yeah. You know, it's nice if we can just have all of our things laid out there and you just do this experiment. Okay, that works. That doesn't work. Let's move forward. Um, there's all these competing interests that that uh, muddy the waters. Yeah. And I think you decisions. have to kind of have a long view. I like Washington. I think he realized he knew that he'd be evaluated later. He saved all of his correspondence and documents because he knew that his life would be studied and people would evaluate what he did or didn't do. And uh, and so the, he's got his uh, dark spots. I think slavery for all those guys was their biggest uh, issue that they just, and, and, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but leaders solve problems and that was the biggest problem in the nation. And it would be right through the civil war. Uh, and they just did not, for whatever reason, for good or not, uh, whether it was right or not, they just didn't feel like they could tackle the biggest problem right mm. out of the chute. And so they, they kicked it, the can down the, the, the road a bit, uh, and sure enough, when it was finally addressed, it became the most devastating war that the U.S. ever fought. Uh, yeah. More soldiers killed in that war than all other wars combined. Uh, mm. And so it, I think these founding fathers knew, uh, had a sense of just how catastrophic it was going to be when that time came. And they just, after all they've been through already, they just didn't want to face that one. So. Um, we'll talk more about Lincoln and, and, and what he did in the upcoming podcast. But uh, just to say again, I don't want anyone to hear me justifying what the Founding Fathers did. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying that it was not as straightforward to those in the, at the time. They didn't have the benefit of history and everything else that we have gained from the last couple hundred years in their time with what the, the books they had accessible, the, the common wisdom, uh, the the economic system, the way it was wired at that time, they didn't see. They agonized about it. They wrote about it. They can. They talked candidly about it, off camera. But uh, at the end of the day, they just didn't see any way of addressing it directly. And mm. Washington, probably as much as anybody, uh, put it in his will when he died that all of his slaves would be set free. Uh, that he, but he he couldn't quite do it in his lifetime or even in his wife's uh, widowhood years. It was after she died uh, that the slaves would be set free. And even then, uh, that only freed about half his slaves. I used to always think that he sla- he, he freed all of his slaves, um, but he legally could not free slaves that belonged to his, grand- his step-grandchildren, the, the, the slaves who came to him through his wife's estates. He was obligated financially to pass those all down to his, to her heirs, and so the mm-hmm. only slaves that he had the power to free were the ones that he owned himself outright. 
and uh, and so he does free all of those, but after he dies. And so yeah. at that point, he didn't have to face any of the consequences. Right. Um, and I mean, this is a man that faced enemy bullets and cannon fire unflinchingly, but uh, even he could not imagine facing the onslaught of what slavery would do to the nation. And uh, of course, it ultimately brought the death of Lincoln uh, several decades later. Yeah. Well, thanks for this first installment of uh, looking at uh, leadership through the Founding Fathers. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners. So email us at podcast at blackv.org.